Airing on Asheville FM, 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week we feature two segments on the show. In the first, Matthew Scott, a journalist with ACPC, or Atlanta Community Press Collective, in Atlanta, Georgia, talks about the recent developments in the struggle against Cop City, which is the building of a giant police training facility with a simulated cityscape for urban counterinsurgency training for law enforcement from around the USA as well as around the world in the Atlanta forest. You can read Matthew's work at atlpresscollective.com. In the conversation, we review the development of the project and the organizing against it. We touch on the current situation of 41 people facing domestic terrorism charges from the state of Georgia. We talk about the SWAT raid and financial crime charges against the Atlanta Solidarity Bail Fund, the vote by city council to move forward with tens of millions of dollars of funding for the project despite more than 15 hours of public comment against it, And we take a look at where the building is now that the clear-cutting has already happened. This conversation happens in the run-up to the sixth week of action in Atlanta to defend the forest. You can find out more information about that at stopcopcitysolidarity.org. Then you'll hear a contribution to May 2023's episode of Bad News from the A-Radio Network by A-Radio Berlin about the upcoming 20th annual Balkan Anarchist Book Fair in Ljubljana, Slovenia, and a little more on the upcoming Saint-Emir International Anarchist and Anti-Authoritarian Gathering in Saint-Emir, Switzerland, on the 151st anniversary of the first anti-authoritarian Workers' International that happened in the same place. Next week, we'll be airing a conversation with supporters of incarcerated anarchist Daniel Baker, who hopefully is going to be released pretty soon from federal prison, um, as well as Mongoose of Mongoose Distro and a couple of comrades from Pushing Down the Walls and Anarchist Black Cross Federation chapter in Orange County to talk about prisoner organizing, Oso Blanco, and other political prisoner issues. Yeah, my name is Matt Scott. I am a journalist with the Atlanta Community Press Collective. So I am based in Atlanta, Georgia. My preferred pronouns are either he or they. Either one works interchangeably. And could you tell us a little bit about Atlanta Community Press Collective, ACPC, which I'm probably going to be using from now on? Like, how did it start? How it works? Who works there? That sort of thing. Yeah, ACPC is definitely the easier way of of referring to it. So ACPC was founded sort of in the fallout or the after period of the 2021 city council vote to approve the cop city lease. So it's been around for about the same time as as the cop city project or the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center project, as it is officially known. Cop City is its unofficial name. And I'm sure we'll get into that a little later here. But it is an abolitionist, uh, not for profit media platform built by community members. So I, I was not one of the founders. I've been a part of ACPC since early last year, since late April, early May of last year, uh, officially. And over that time, ACPC first came on the scene with a sort of an exhaustive history of the area in which this project is supposed to be built. It was known as the Old Atlanta Prison Farm. And then once I joined, I, I started to write sort of articles about things that were happening as they were happening. And we transitioned into more of of a journalism outlet and uh, have begun bringing on more people. So we're at this point, we're about at seven individuals who are either volunteers or there's myself, full full time staff member, a part time staff member as well. uh, And we are looking to continue to expand. And you mentioned that ACPC started up in conjunction with like a a part of the movement to stop Cop City. Is ACPC uh, part of that movement? Is it alongside of that movement? Like, what's its relationship with that? We are movement aligned. We are not part of the movement. There is there is definitely a separation, and uh, very intentionally, I you know we we do, we are not the mouthpiece of the movement. We do take the the work of journalism very seriously, and so we acknowledge that we have definitely a position, and we are coming at this from an abolitionist perspective, where we don't want to see Cop City built, but we operate outside of the movement. 
uh, in order to retain that that independence and that separation where we are doing journalistic work uh, without being compromised. Cool. And for listeners who somehow haven't heard or maybe heard the wrong thing, can you give a brief rundown of the struggle against Cop City, or what Cop City is itself, and, and like the resistance that people have been putting up against its construction? I know there's a lot of history right there. Yes. So uh, Cop City is a $90 million public safety training center that is set to be built in an area of, of Atlanta called the South River Forest. This is the largest contiguous piece of forested land in Atlanta. It's one of the largest I- internal like city forested land pieces in the entire country. And it is known as one of the four lungs of Atlanta. So this is, uh, you know, essentially uh, for the neighborhoods around uh, the the cop city, it, it's where sort of flood protection takes place. Uh, obviously, it has a cooling effect. And of course, it has a, a carbon capture effect. So this is a very important piece of forested land that is also attached to a river. It's called the South River. Um, and there's a creek that entrenchment creek that runs from this this area of forest into the South River, which is one of the uh, one of the endangered uh, waterways. So there are a lot of environmental concerns all around this project, in addition to the concerns about police militarization. So this is called Cop City because part of this facility will be essentially a police tactical training section that imitates real life. So there's a at this point there's scheduled to be built. Uh, basically a city block with a gas station, a nightclub, apartments, and a house that police can use to to simulate, you know, real life events. They would argue that it's to simulate active shooter events. More, more often than active shooter events, police are used to put down protest events, and that is also where this would be practiced. So that's how the Cop City name came about. The project started all the way back in, in 2016, but kind of fell off until 2021 when it was sort of brought about again by the Atlanta Police Foundation, where they said, you know, it will be built in this this area of land. And they kind of pitched it to city council and city council approved. And there was a lot of public debate about the the project, but a lot of the debate in front of city council was controlled. There was 17 hours of public comment that was at this point during the height of the COVID era. And so city council was meeting remotely. So it's 17 hours of Virtual public comment, 70% of it was against passing this lease to build the facility. After the passage of the lease, people began to occupy the land. They became known as forest defenders. And so sort of towards the end of 2021, it was about December of 2021, they set up a, a permanent encampment that was broken down by police about a month later. So it was really from January of 2022 all the way until January of 2023, there was a permanent encampment. Uh, throughout, there were several sites throughout the forest where, where people were actively holding down the land, building tree sits in order to stop the facility from being constructed, to stop, you know, engineers from being able to come onto the site and, and, and lay down planning stakes and things like that. So they very effectively did halt construction for a significant period of time. In December of 2022, the police had a raid where they arrested uh, six people and charged them with domestic terrorism charges. Uh, and then the, in January of 2023, there was another raid where they arrested seven people and they killed a protester. And this is what is recognized um, probably unfairly as the first police murder or police killing of an environmental protester in the United States. It's the first one that's recorded as such. But of course, police have likely killed protesters, maybe not as connected with a a particular struggle before without the recognition. So at this point now, the opposition to the project is is a pretty vast coalition from anarchists to environmentalists to, you know, regular old uh, like soccer moms, essentially, there are preschoolers, uh, there's there's an entire preschool where their curricula is dedicated to to studying the, this forest and uh, the indigenous name, the Muscogee Creek name for it, the Wilani Forest. So we kind of use that interchangeably. So they, their curricula is studying the Wilani Forest. And now with uh, a referendum campaign that just launched, that coalition continues to grow. It's expanded into sort of more electorally minded orgs. And throughout the last year, we've we've seen just this constant expansion in, in, in the umbrella that is the Stop Cop City movement. Cool. Thanks for that that summary. 
So the the last time that the show featured an interview concerning the Atlanta Forest Defense, it was immediately after the murder of Manuel Tortuguita Tehran by police. And you, you make a very good point that this is listed as the first killing by police of of someone involved directly in an environmental movement in the U.S. And that's like there are so many instances where because of ecological defense work often being so just dis- like distinguished geographically from cities or from a lot of witnesses, there's kind of no way to, to prove to make that claim. Right. There's tons of times when this could have happened without witnesses or without like the amount of media attention that it's gotten. A number of police claims from that time have been proven false by the independent autopsy um, and continued media investigation and popular pressure. For instance, the officer who possibly shot himself, but the police were, I'm not sure if it was the Georgia State Bureau of Infor- of Investigation or the Atlanta police or the troopers or who was making the claim that this cop was shot by Tortuguita and that this was an act of like defense, self-defense by the cop. But, but yeah, the, like the, that's just one of the, the things the the morning meditation position that it was found that Tortuguita was probably in when they were shot. I, I was wondering if you are aware of anything leading to charges against the Atlanta police or any sort of response from in like from official institutions to this new evidence coming up or challenges to their their claims there is currently a lawsuit against the Atlanta Police Department for withholding information uh from the family of Manuel Paez Turan or or tort as as I will call them so that that is a lawsuit uh, just for you know the withholding of, of documents so that that the family can learn what happened there is a Georgia Bureau of Investigation um investigation that that uh happened around this so it was georgia state patrol was um the the police unit that that killed tortuguita and uh georgia state patrolman was the officer who was allegedly shot by tortuguita so the if there were any state charges that they would be levied against uh georgia state patrol those georgia state patrol officers uh that investigation from gbi was turned over to a district attorney in north georgia and there has not been an update on the case since it was turned over uh at i believe it was sometime late april is when what maybe early may when the case was turned over so we we haven't heard an update on that as far as civil actions against the police you know i i would imagine that the investigation or or the family's investigation into the killing of tortuguita will probably lead at some point to some sort of civil action against georgia state patrol but as far as any other litigation against Atlanta police for the killing of Tortuguita, I don't think that there would be any. And it is through, uh, you know, body camera footage uh, from the Atlanta Police Department from one of their uh, special teams. The team is called Apex. It's uh, similar to the Scorpion team that that killed Tyree Nichols. So they, their body cam footage uh, had one of their officers say, um, you know, you you shot your own guy, essentially talking about the officer who was injured during that raid to so that. That's sort of why this lawsuit against APD is happening, because they apparently do have some information that they, they were withholding uh, at the request of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Yeah, it's it's wacky. So statewide repression against the movement to stop Cap City has continued to spread, which can be seen in the recent arrest in Atlanta City by, I think, Atlanta PD, as well as with the authority of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation of three activists doing bail support with the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. And these folks were initially charged with money laundering and charity fraud. Can you talk a little bit about what you know about this this like SWAT style raid and where the activists are now? Yeah. So to kind of talk about this, we have to go to um, late February. And in late February, there were conversations about the potential of of RICO charges, racketeering influenced corrupt organization charges against the Defend the Forest movement. And it was actually the Atlanta Solidarity Fund that that opened up those conversations. They provided the evidence that these charges they believe were forthcoming. And then they had a presentation with the Civil Liberties Defense Center to kind of explain what RICO charges were. And uh, we're going to kind of hold those RICO charges in our brain as we kind of continue on here. But they expected RICO charges to drop before the week of action, and then they never did. ACPC actually released documents from the Atlanta Police Foundation where they were ensuring uh, or assuring, I should say, their board and contractors that 
that indictments would be coming against forest defenders to hopefully disrupt the movement. They, they were setting those out, you know, sort of in early February. Uh, the charges never came, but through conversations uh, or, or comments by prosecutors in the cases against the domestic terrorism defendants, they started to lay out this financial case and, and more and more indication that they were planning on on doing some sort of uh, financial crimes charge. And a lot of these prosecutorial comments revolved around the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. At one point, a prosecutor said that the Atlanta Solidarity Fund is being investigated as at the center of this whole thing. So the Atlanta Solidarity Fund organizers were, were kind of aware that this was likely to happen um, and, and had prepared some comment for it and uh, had prepared another bail fund, this time a, a national bail network to take over handling bail here in in, in Atlanta uh, in the case of, you know, that these charges came down. So it was uh, May 31st, uh, early in the morning, uh, a police SWAT vehicle, an armored vehicle and a SWAT team broke down the door of a house called the Teardown. And this is a house in a gentrifying neighborhood that is an anti-gentrification house. They've lived there for, I believe, something like a decade at this point, maybe even a little bit longer. Out of this house, they ran Atlanta's Food Not Bombs until COVID hit. They now run a uh, another nonprofit uh, called Food for Life that, that provides thousands of pounds of free food each week. They also do a cop watch program. And of course, the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, the bail fund program. So a lot of things are, are run out of this house and Atlanta Solidarity Fund predates the Cop City movement. It goes all the way back to 2016, where it was organized in response to anti-Confederate and anti-fascist um, demonstrations. So they were arrested early that morning in their pajamas, taken to jail. And, you know, we're, we're reading these warrants and these warrants are alleging that they are committing charity fraud through misuse of funds and that misuse of funds or some of those misuse of funds that are cited as examples are reimbursements for gas, uh, reimbursements for COVID tests, reimbursements for, you know, just supplies in general, purchasing a cell phone as is would be needed when you're operating a bail fund. So the charity fraud aspects of it, and then they alleged that there was money laundering when the Atlanta Solidarity Fund sent, I believe it was $20,000 to another bail network. And then that bail network sent that $20,000 back. Uh, so, you know, in order to be money laundering, there, there had to be a, a crime that was covered up or you know, a second crime in, in this transfer and said it was just a, a straight transfer from one entity to another and back. And all of this is, of course, trackable on on the open collective platform. So the, the charges were incredibly weak, but nevertheless, prosecutors brought them forward. Uh, and then when they were brought in front of a judge, even the judge was like, there, there, there's not much meat on the bones here. You're going to have to do a lot better work if you want these charges to to stick or to hold up in court. So the Judge granted uh, these organizers a fifteen thousand dollar bond, which may sound like a lot, but in Atlanta, we're we're now dealing with anywhere from like three hundred thousand dollar to six hundred thousand dollar bonds for a lot of our defendants uh, arrested in relation to this movement. So it, it was uh, pretty small in comparison. So they they are now out of jail. They are not allowed to post anything on social media, which is why you probably haven't heard uh, anything from them as one of the stipulations of their bail conditions. They are allowed to talk to the press and talk to media. So they, they have been doing that. So you might see them, you know, one of them was on like the Young Turks uh, last week. And then they've been on sort of national radio stations and, and uh, national networks as well. But they are doing well They're You know, they, they knew this was coming. And of course, it's a traumatic event, but they were they were prepared for it. In context of of what you say, where there was com like clear, clear communication going back to like February, where the police foundation and other authority well i guess it's not an authority but like authorities had said to investors and such that um there were arrests that were being readied that were going to impact the ability of the movement to be able to respond to the cop city project it seems pretty clear that one could make the argument that there's an attempt to impose a chilling effect on what could be deemed defensible First Amendment activities. I don't know if that's a, a thing that's being pursued at this point or if people are still kind of 
um, just rolling with the punches and trying to trying to get the project stopped before like thinking about bringing extra lawsuits against authorities. Yes. So that the the chilling effect is definitely, uh, you know, from all appearances, that is the intent of this. It's unclear if, if prosecutors really do think that that the Solidarity Fund is like some sort of financial entity that is really underpinning the movement or if they are they are going after the the bail fund aspect of it itself especially in light of you know uh, we've got an upcoming week of action at the end of this month and they might have wanted to take it out in advance of that to to discourage people from from engaging in first amendment activities with you know without knowing that there was going to be a bail fund to to back them up but there isn't any legal action against that that i am aware of uh, there have been calls the um NAACP Legal Defense Fund published an open letter calling for a DOJ investigation into, in particular, these charges of uh, money laundering and and charity fraud as uh, repressive tactics. So litigation might be forthcoming, or there might be a you know some sort of external investigation. I, I, a DOJ investigation was also called for by Senator Raphael Warnock. So uh, we'll see we'll see how that plays out, but it definitely does strike as an attempt to chill uh, engagement against this project. You mentioned domestic terrorism charges earlier against people that were engaging in or were just found in the forest, but maybe some who who might have been engaging in tree sit activities. The state of Georgia continues to slap activists with these domestic terrorism charges, despite the fact that the protests people have attended don't fall into, uh, this is just my opinion, but uh, any reasonable definition of terrorism. And as far as I'm aware, the Department of Homeland Security, the federal institution that would oversee charges of this sort, has recently reiterated that it doesn't apply the term to any domestic formations or movements, that there's no domestic terrorism charges or domestic terrorist groups that it recognizes. Um, are you aware of how many people are still inside and how many are facing these kinds of charges and for what sort of activities? Yes. Uh, so there are 42 charges of domestic terrorism across 41 people. One person was charged twice, stemming from two separate events. Of those 41 people, there are two people that are still being held. The person who has two charges just had their bail revoked from their first charge. So they are now uh, in DeKalb County Jail after you know violating their, their bail conditions. And then a uh, second individual, uh, Victor Puertas, was arrested on March 5th. And, and charged with domestic terrorism and was released from DeKalb County Jail after 90 days. But then once he was released from DeKalb County Jail, he was picked up by ICE. He is a, a foreign national, but a, but a resident. So he has lived here for, I believe, something like a decade at this point. But he was taken by ICE and brought to Stort County ICE Detention Facility, which is another, you know, DeKalb County Jail where he was held for those 90 days is is one of the worst jails in the state. And Stewart County Detention Center is is also, you know, uh, pretty atrocious and and kind of constantly under attack by by civil rights uh, watchdog groups for for its conditions. So he's continuing to suffer pretty, pretty awful conditions for attending a, a music festival. And then other than that, there's uh, another individual who is being held in uh, a county sort of north of Atlanta called Bartow County under charges of felony stalking and intimidation of a police officer for passing out flyers. And these flyers said, you know, in your neighborhood, there is uh, there's a killer and named the Georgia State police officers who who killed Tortuguita. So they were they were passing those out in, in the neighborhood of, of this officer of this Georgia State Patrol trooper, I should say. And the trooper called the local police and and said that he wanted to press charges and that he felt threatened. So there were three individuals charged with that. One of them is is still being held in in jail for that. And uh, the reason that they are still being held is that they took a reimbursement from an account that is linked to the Solidarity Fund, sort of under this umbrella network of nonprofits. Uh, and so prosecutors use that reimbursement for camping equipment as a way to claim that this person was deeply involved with the Defend the Forest movement and the judge uh, did not grant them bond condition. I understand that because this is such a hot topic and because there's a lot of right-wing trolls out there, 
I would imagine that a lot of people are wary of having their personal information put out on the internet. But are you aware of any places where people who do want support who are still being held or facing charges where one can find more information about them in order to to try to help them out? Yes. So every defendant individually is asked whether they would like their name put out there for things like support. So that is handled by the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. And so that that is the Solidarity Fund is continuing to operate and the jail support network is continuing to operate. Their social media accounts would be the best place to find that. And so they, you know, they have posted uh, about Victor Puertas and, and what uh, Victor is is looking for in terms of support and how to send messages. Charlie is the defendant in Bartow County. I know that they are also you know, looking for contact and messages. And I believe the defendant who is in DeKalb County is also looking for that. But I, I, I I'm not sure. So I won't say their name, but all that information would be on the Atlanta Solidarity Fund's uh, uh, social networks, uh, their Instagram account. Cool. That's super helpful. So earlier this month, we saw at least 15 hours of public comment at city council by Atlanta residents, uh, overwhelmingly speaking against funding Cop City before the city council decided to vote for double the initial funding for Cop City um, that was initially requested, as you quoted, $90 million, uh, of which uh, $1.3 million, I guess, would be spent paid every year towards it for the next 30 years, besides like a lump sum. But there are some city council members claimed that institutions like the Atlanta Police Department are a part of their constituency and one of the groups that they felt responsible for. And so that was one of the like deciding to approve the funding and increased funding for this project was counterweighed by statements by institutions like the APD. Have you gotten a sense of response from the public to this vote? Yeah, and I, I should say first the breakdown. Um, so the city of Atlanta is going to pay sixty-seven million dollars total. Uh, we're going to pay thirty million dollar lump sum payment, and then it's one point two million dollars a year for thirty years for an extra thirty-six million dollars out of the alleged ninety million dollar total. Um, and that's important because the Atlanta Police Foundation said they were going to pay sixty million dollars of the ninety million dollars, and now that is flipped. So the, the 15 hours of public comment was pretty enlightening for a lot of people. And what we saw even leading up to that, so two weeks prior or three weeks prior, I should say, there was another public comment session at, that was shorter. It was, uh, I believe, seven and a half hours, just under seven and a half hours. And uh, after that, people started to come out to uh, subcommittee meetings and they were talking about how they were activated by watching all of these people come out and give public comment and basically just be ignored. So we are continuing to see that effect, and that's playing out now through the referendum effort where people are, you know, saying, okay, well, if, if city council isn't going to listen to the people, then we are going to take matters into our own hands uh, and and do this this referendum where, you know, on the uh, a straight up or down vote on canceling the lease uh, will potentially be on the November uh, election ballot. So you're seeing a lot of condemnation uh, amongst the people. But the arguments that that city council has put forth, those who voted for the facility, I'm not really seeing anything other than a very small minority of, of people in favor of the facility, like accepting the people opposed to the facility. And, and even people who are kind of on the fence are still pretty shocked by by the fact that you can have, you know, the largest public comment uh, session, in-person public comment session in in. Uh, at least modern history, if not, you know, all of Atlanta history, just be summarily ignored. And at this point, it's something like between the call in public comment and all of the in person public comment on this last go around, we're at something like 48 hours uh, of public comment. So essentially two, two actual days of public comment and a small minority of that was against. And, you know, I, I don't think you see that really anywhere else. If if this was anything else other than this police training center, I, I don't think we would even be talking about, you know, going against that. But since we are talking about police and we are talking about, in particular, the Atlanta Police Foundation, we are having a very different conversation where it seems like the the public will is is being ignored. So the remainder of that ninety million then would be coming, I guess, from the. Atlanta Police Foundation, which is backed by independent investors, companies like Waffle House, Home Depot, Nationwide Insurance, stuff like that. Is that right? 
Yeah, they the last number I heard is that they were able to raise thirty three point four million dollars in actual you know do, uh, donations from from corporations and other philanthropic funds like the Robert Woodruff Foundation, uh, and then they also have a five million dollar new market tax credits uh, that they're getting. So they're they're bringing you know roughly thirty eight million dollars. The the price of this this facility is going to be higher than ninety million dollars, but you know by the time everything is said and done, but Right now, they, they've brought, you know, that $38 million and then they have a $20 million construction loan that is being paid off from what we understand through the $1.2 million yearly payments. At what point in the process is the actual construction of Cop City and destruction of the forest right, right there in, in the South Commons? Yeah, so we are unfortunately in the second phase of construction. So clear cutting is 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 over, and we are moving into mass grading. And you know, clear cutting is of course environmentally devastating, um, but mass grading is is changing the contours of land permanently. So we are we are having a a large impact on the ecological structure of the South River Forest at this point. Uh, they are anticipating starting you know actual construction. Uh, in late August, whether they are able to do so is going to depend on the referendum and potential injunctions or, you know, possible direct actions taken by actors down the line. Would injunctions be a separate process than the referendum? Or is that like a part of the referendum that while once signatures have been collected and it's like put to, to city council, I guess, to review that information, would that like automatically force a stop in the construction or would they be able to just sort of stall it out and continue um, the process of building cop city? So the organizers of the referendum are definitely going to seek injunctions. At this point, there was a prior court case on environmental grounds to overturn the land disturbance permit for cop city. And, and when that was ongoing, that attorney also sought injunctive relief and was denied. So we can expect the Atlanta Police Foundation to to fight any injunction and for that environmental action injunction. The CEO, Dave Wilkinson of the Atlanta Police Foundation, said that, you know, he wanted construction to continue uh, and that, you know, anyone could file for injunction. And, and it would essentially be insane to have to stop construction for any injunction filed against you uh, or any action filed against you. So until a judge signs off on an injunction order, we can expect the Atlanta Police Foundation to continue construction. So with the referendum, there, there will likely be two injunctions. The first injunction they will seek when it looks like they will have enough signatures. So when they can argue, uh, reasonably argue in front of a judge that we are likely to succeed in our signature collection campaign. And that will hold construction until the end of the signature collecting window. If they are able to collect the number of signatures that they require, then they will seek another uh, injunction to get injunctive relief all the way until the November 7th election. Okay, and I can see this being such a um, divisive topic that that might have an impact on unelected officials and and how concerned they are about keeping their seats. You had mentioned that there's an upcoming week of action around the forest defense. Uh, are you aware of the details of it, of any of the like public events or um, where more information could be found, what days it's going to cross? So I, I know the dates uh, will be June 24th through July 1st. I know there is a kickoff event uh, on June 24th at 1 p.m. I do not believe the venue has been publicly announced. Uh, and then there will be another music festival on July 1st uh, at the end of the week of action. And the venue has not been announced for that either. A lot of this uh, week of action seems to be a lot quieter than, than past weeks of action. And we expect to find information uh, in terms of what is happening and where it's happening closer to the event time. Uh, that information will be available on the various Defend the Forest social uh, media accounts. Um, and then there is a, a calendar on defendtheatlantaforest.org that I believe will be updated uh, to include the events once they are, are made public. Considering the really heavy level of repression that people have been facing increasingly as the movement has gone on, is there much in the way of discussion from coordinators, organizers, or announcers of these events about ways that people can keep themselves safer while also attending and resisting? 
there are I, I am aware that there are internal conversations about keeping community members and keeping uh, other activists and organizers safe throughout the process. I'm sure there will be education that goes on during the week of action that is actually typically or historically that has been done how to keep yourself safe, you know, what to do when you are, uh, you know, when, a, when a police officer approaches you, those sorts of conversations are ones that were had by the Solidarity Fund organizers who are arrested. And I don't know if that uh, if they will be doing that this time around, but they do have other people uh, working in that cop watch organization or volunteering, I should say, in that cop watch organization who will do so. So the conversations are happening. I am sure that there will be some guidance given at the the start of particular events about what they can expect. But of course, when you are dealing with uh, police, you you never really know uh, if they are going to overreact or not. So there is a level of risk involved in in any of these events, even the ones that may seem you know relatively germane, because the unpredictability of police. Well, I know in the past there have been coordinated like info tours. I don't know if that's a thing that you've heard anything about just in different places to sort of hype up the the week in advance and answer questions and get people informed. Is that a thing that you've heard of? Or maybe people should just check out scenes from the forest or other sites? Yeah, that information would be on uh, various websites. I know that that's something that's happened in the past and organizers in, in various cities will, will talk about the week of action There's, before it happens and you know, ahead of the last week of action, there was the week of solidarity, where, you know, solidarity events took place in, in home cities and, and these sorts of events happened. I am not aware of any of them coming up. Uh, I do believe that after this week of action, there there will be some sort of actual info tour by organizers here kind of going around uh, speaking about Cop City in, in cities around at least the southeast, if not further afield. But I am not aware of anything happening leading up to the week of action in that regard. And just to to sort of tie this up and, and talk again about ACPC, I recall in past conversations that I've had about the movement to stop Cop City that the coverage from the Atlanta uh, Journal-Constitution has been pretty, pretty terrible. And I think that they have, I believe they have some sort of connection to the Police Foundation, or am I am I wrong on that? So the Atlanta Journal Constitution is owned by Cox Media Group, which is owned by Cox Enterprises. And the chairman of Cox Enterprises is Alex C. Taylor, who is a Cox family heir. But he served as the head of fundraising for the Cop City Project. And Cox has donated several million dollars to to the Cop City Project itself. So the coverage that has happened in our in our paper of record in the Atlanta Journal Constitution hasn't been good by and large. Uh, that has changed over the last couple months. There's a, a journalist named Riley Bunch who's taken over essentially the Cop City beat, and she's done more uh, engagement and more critique and more challenge of, of the general narrative. So it is changing to some extent. The editorial board uh, that runs uh, the AJC is still producing pro-Cop City editorials at a rapid rate. So it is definitely driven uh, to toward bias uh, coverage of of the Public Safety Training Center or, or Cop City, but there are, are definitely journalists within the organization who are trying to do good work or in, you know, are, are trying to actually engage in this project like like uh, you would expect a, a an outlet to do. Uh, it, it feels like independent media projects often rise up because people aren't seeing the conversations that they want to see in the mainstream media or legacy media or whatever around them. Um, I wonder, like, as a member of ACPC, have you what sort of impact have you seen um, from like any shifts in narrative? Do you think that like the change in direction of the um, AJC towards covering Cop City has been impacted by the journalism that y'all have have been doing? Or are there other areas that other content content or topics that y'all have covered that you've seen um, seen a shift in conversations about? In regard to, uh, I would certainly like to think that the coverage that we've done and and the work that we've done has had an impact on the AJC's editorial decisions. Um, I I you know I have no evidence to that fact, but I I would like to believe so. And uh, to your point, uh, ACPC definitely did come in the wake of of a lack of of journalistic engagement to this project. Um, 
similar there there was another uh publication here in in Atlanta called The Great Speckled Bird that existed in the 60s and 70s uh that that came um in in, in very similar circumstances where uh at that point it was uh there were the journal and the constitution uh were, were separate papers that were published uh, in the morning and, and at night but they they didn't engage in the Vietnam War uh in the way that left leaning individuals thought they should so they they started their own publication uh they started the great speckled bird and and it became this this infamous and very important media institution in the city of atlanta they published you know exposés uh, on the mayor the, their offices were firebombed so they had, they had this very strong impact on 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 the media landscape in atlanta and i i would like to think that we are following in the footsteps of of the great speckled bird in in that regard Oh, awesome. Um, well, where can people find more work from ACPC? Hey, uh, you can check out our website, atlpresscollective.com. We also spend a lot of time really thinking through a multimodal approach to delivering the news. So our, our Twitter feed, um, Atlanta underscore press has a lot of, of information that, that maybe isn't necessarily great for a full article, but it's still important information to have. And then our, Instagram account ATL Press Collective or at ATL Press Collective. Uh, we do deeper dives in, in terms of video stories. Cool. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, out of your busy schedule to have this conversation and, and the work that y'all do. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. If you want to support the Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay. Or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf support. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. I know the kind of pain you're feeling, Alex. I once had it myself. You some kind of doctor? No, Alex. I am Magneto, and I have come to offer you sanctuary. Hello, this is our jingle for our podcast, The Grounded Futures Show. This is the show where we discuss topics ranging from climate change to identity to how youth can gain new skills to thrive amid current and ongoing disasters that we are collectively facing. We are your hosts, one Gen Z Liam and one Gen X Carla. And we think we all deserve to thrive now and not in some distant utopian future. Yeah, but that's in the future. Oh, I hate the future. Yeah, we're with Bolin. Grounded Futures is a larger project, so check that out over at groundedfutures.com. So we're talking with a comrade from Ljubljana in so-called Slovenia, where the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair for its 20th anniversary will be returning to. The event will be happening from the 7th to the 9th of July, that is two weeks before the saint gathering. Maybe before we start with the interview, could you present yourself shortly, your political background, your involvement with the book fair? Okay, so yes, uh, thank you for having me. I am Peter, I am involved with the anarchist movement in uh, Ljubljana for many years uh, now. I am part of the local anarchist group that is part of the Anarchist Federation that is connecting the uh, anarchist groups in Slovenia and parts of Croatia. I have been involved through this organization also with the Balkan Anarchist uh, Network and with the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair as a specific project. Uh, I was actually also involved with the organization of the first book fair and of the discussion that led to the uh, to this project, to the initiative to create this kind of event for the Balkan anarchist movement. So that's amazing. We are happy to have you here. In any case, um, in its first public call for the Balkan anarchist book fair, the organizational assembly of the book fair wrote that uh, since the other big international anarchist gathering in saint was happening soon after, you wanted to create an organic connection between the two gatherings. Could you elaborate a bit about this idea and also how it's being translated into the practice of organizing the event? Okay, so um, obviously... 
our movement and our local structures are involved with the internationalist uh, anarchist uh, movement. Our local uh, organization has few axes of international connection, organization and so on. Beside the Balkans is also, of course, other parts of Europe. And uh, because of that, obviously, we have uh, on, the, on our radar for a long time already the, the big anniversary of the Anarchist International and the Santi Me meeting uh, this summer. So when we were uh, organizing, when we started to organize uh, the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair, we had this in mind. So it was for us, it was important to somehow connect these two events, also choose a date that would maybe facilitate uh, participation of people on both events for those who want to participate in both events. But we also wanted to, to give opportunity maybe to people who are coming to the Santimie meeting from uh, far, far away from other continents to maybe use also this opportunity and come to Ljubljana for the book fair. So we decided to organize a book fair two weeks before the Santimie meeting. And we tried to promote it together with the, with the Santime meeting. One point for us, it also uh, may be technical or geographical, but I think it's uh, interesting and important. Slovenia is uh, located in a specific geography. As we say, it, it's the north border of the Balkans, but it also borders Central and uh, West Europe. So it, it is a space where, uh, where uh, people from different parts of Europe and world uh, can uh, easy meet so this was this was also one of the one of the thinkings generally in a political sense uh, we think it is important to connect these two meetings uh, also because we believe that uh, parts of Europe are not so well uh, introduced into the Balkan anarchist and anti-authoritarian movement there are not a lot of uh, strong connections uh, the, with the Balkan especially with the smaller uh, movements in uh, in in some of the the countries of ex Yugoslavia and maybe some others also. So for us, it's also a big opportunity, like the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair in Ljubljana this year. It's, a, it's an opportunity for people uh, from different parts of Europe to meet. Uh, be introduced into the into the Balkan anarchism, into the history of the Balkan anarchism, and to create connections for the future uh, cooperation struggles, uh, networking, and so on. One of the hopes we have as an anarchist radio Berlin towards the Santimir gathering is that it might be a place to have different parts of the anarchist movement, also not just European-centered, having them talk about how we can enact real change, how we can get away from just being a philosophy to being something practical. And um, in the open call of the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair, a similar wish is formulated where it asks, are we doing enough and are we successful in building counterpower needed for real change? And uh, my question is how you're trying to do this in the in form of the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair. Are there specific uh, program parts or debates you're looking for? Yes, as you mentioned, um, we articulated, I think, very strongly in the first call for participation in the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair, part of the political agenda of this meeting we are organizing in Ljubljana. In this call, we also say that for us, uh, the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair was never only about books. It was mainly understood as a tool of the movement, the physical space where comrades from different countries can meet and have opportunity to discuss important questions. Not only discuss important questions, but also try to organize, to network, to create uh, connections and uh, future activities. Uh, so with all this in mind, this is like the political agenda of the meeting. We, we went into the organization of the, of the event itself. Firstly, uh, for us, it was very important. We think that at the, at, at the moment, there are many, many problems that uh, are not facing only our movement, but is facing our society. The Ukraine war being just the most extreme example of all of these problems that uh, uh, we as a society are facing at this time. And uh, we think that uh, Balkan Anarchist Book Fair and also the Santime meeting uh, will be an important point 
where these important questions can be discussed and where different proposals can be uh, articulated with the hope to find some common solutions to make more concrete steps in the future towards our political agenda. So for us, one thing is clear. As anarchists uh, in our local organization, we have a very strong um, principle which we call anti-sectarianism. We think that uh, it is very important at this time, not only at this time, but generally, and we try to do this also in practice, is to have uh, some kind of discussion, cooperation uh, with all parts of the uh, different anarchist tendencies or movements and even beyond the anarchist movement, because the questions are too big for small, small philosophical uh, groupings or reading circles or whatever to address them in a, in a serious way. This is our principle. We thought to do this, we have to invite uh, all parts of the anarchist movement to the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair. And and we tried to, to do this and we sent uh, hundreds of uh, personal uh, concrete emails to different uh, groups, organizations, collectives, people from uh, all parts of the world actually and from different kind of uh, anarchist tendencies. So we understand this uh, space, the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair is an open space of the whole anarchist movement and a space where we can discuss important questions together in a sense of how we try to how we will try to, to do this in practice with the program of the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair one of the ideas is to have not so much uh, smaller presentations that are organized by specific group on specific topic but to have uh, more broad topics uh, that are organized in uh, some kind of cluster way for format which would mean that um, people from different uh, perspectives from different groups organized organizations and geographies can speak together on one topic. So cluster discussions will be one of the formats with which we try to address this uh, agenda. And the other one will be, of course, organizational meetings. Uh, we hope that for a lot of uh, content of the book fair, there will uh, follow also some of the organizational efforts in a sense of uh, networking, in a sense of writing uh, uh, statements, publishing proposals after the book fair, and hopefully also already preparing some of the activities for the future. Yes, that sounds good. The next question is about uh, the anarchist movement in the Balkans. Is there such a thing? And uh, if there is, what do you think based on their history, based on their own experiences with uh, practice and theory, what can they bring? What are the strong points, the important topics that they can bring to Santimir later on? Yes, I definitely uh, think that there is such thing as anarchist uh, uh, movement in the Balkans and the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair is just one of the expressions of this movement and also one of the tools connecting this movement. Obviously, the movement is developed in different regions uh, in a different, on a different uh, level. 
but uh, there is a strong strong wish to create a common network and uh, we also understand the book fair as a way to do this for instance in the past uh, we we had uh, we put a lot of efforts into supporting the the small movements in countries like uh, Kosovo or Macedonia or Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, with the organization of the book fair, book fair there they somehow become uh, more involved uh, with the network the other thing is also some of the countries like Turkey for instance with which we don't have a lot of connections although there is a strong movement uh, present and we try to also connect the movement to our network and this year we also put a lot of efforts into bringing people that are usually not participating in the book fairs like people from uh, from Istanbul will be coming from three different groups I think uh, there will be f- people from Kosovo from Macedonia and from Bosnia and Herzegovina so we were successful in this way and we hope that it will be a next step to creating these contacts uh, and network for the future regarding content that the Balkan anarchist book fair can bring to the international anarchist movement or to the specifically to the Santimie anarchist gatherings i think there are uh, some specifics uh, like the Balkan especially with the experience of the former socialist uh, Yugoslavia with the wars of the 90s uh, and with a totally different um, uh, his history of uh, Turkey for instance in the southeast of the Balkans I think there are uh, some of the differences and some of the good uh, contents that the movement from the Balkans can bring to the movement of the other parts of Europe two of these uh, contents are for sure the consistent anti-nationalism that uh, the movement is developing uh, throughout the years and which was always a very important point also at the political level of the Balkan Anarchist Network and Balkan Anarchist Book Fair as an event. Obviously this is because of the horrible uh, horrific experience of the Yugoslav wars in the 90s where we saw how nationalism was used by the political and economical elites to divide people and uh, create gains for them themselves. Another thing is connected with this, another topic, and which is also very much discussed in the Balkan Anarchist Network and part of the content of all of the book first is uh, anti-militarist perspective. It is also connected with the experience of the Yugoslav wars in the 90s or on one level and also on, the, in, on another level for instance the experience of Greek state uh, of the movement there with the connection with the NATO, NATO and America American uh, armies. Uh, so the anti-militarist perspective is a very strong, strong perspective and I think uh, that was articulated or discussed or practiced in a little bit maybe different, uh, different way. For instance, uh, when talking about war in Ukraine, Balkan anarchist uh, Bukfer was articulating the, the question about it already in 2014 at the Balkan anarchist Bukfer that was held in Mostar. Mostar is a Bosnian city that was totally divided uh, by two nationalities and uh, destroyed by by the war. And we thought it was a very good symbolic point to express explicit, consistent anti-nationalist and anti-militarist perspective at this book fair. So I hope uh, the perspective, the people from the West or from the East uh, will listen to the, to the articulations about war nationalism uh, from the Balkan anarchists because I think they, ca- they, they have or we have uh, some important points uh, to share. Okay, as a last question, could you tell us where people can find more information about the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair online and how they can reach you if they have questions or proposals? And uh, secondly, could you sh- very shortly um, tell us a bit about the logistics that people need to know if they are coming to Ljubljana, like accommodation, food, or whatever. You can find all the information about the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair 2023 in Ljubljana at our website. Website is uh, bab 2023spivblogsnet or bab 2023autonomiaorg There you will find all the information you need. Uh, we are updating the site regularly. So I think uh, everything you need to know is there. All the information, also the contact that you can use for announcing your participation or sharing your proposals or questions. The email is bab2023 at riseup.net. 
You can get some of the information also at the info events we are doing as part of the promotion of the event uh, in different parts of Europe. Uh, info events are also listed on the website and this is more or less all you need to know. Regarding the logistics, uh, as we are expecting a lot of people, a lot of comrades coming to the book fair, many hundreds maybe even, uh, this will be a big uh, logistical challenge for us, for uh, the organizational team, especially in a sense to organize, to arrange uh, the free accommodation for everybody that is coming or for everybody that uh, would need to have a free accommodation in Ljubljana. But we are uh, optimistic, uh, we are putting a lot of efforts also in this way and we think that it will be possible to host all of the people in our communal spaces in social centers in squats in other communal spaces but also a lot uh, with at the flats and houses of our comrades and supporters Generally, uh, we are asking people who can afford to try to arrange, organize the accommodation by themselves, but this is just for those who can do this. Uh, otherwise, contact us through email and we will find a solution. All other things at the book fair will be organized in accordance with the anarchist principles of anti-authoritarian and self-organization. So there will be a lot of uh, space where comrades coming to the book fair can actively get involved with uh, all the help that will be needed from technical infrastructural uh, food and other tasks uh, and of course also in a sense of content of um, organization of, of the event itself its uh, discussions its activities organizational meetings and beyond that so just a uh, big invitation to everybody we think it will be a big strong important uh, gathering we hope to get positive results after afterwards that can be used for our future struggles check out more episodes of bad news angry voices from around the world the english language international podcast that comes out monthly from the a radio network at a hyphen radio hyphen network dot org and now some words from anarchist prisoner sean swain pat robertson finally died maybe there is a god Pat Robertson founded the Christian Broadcasting Network and the 700 Club. He was a prolific evangelical fundamentalist of the most conservative and reactionary faction of Christianity, creating a multi-million dollar empire for Jesus. He founded the Moral Majority with fellow thumper Jerry Falwell in the late 70s, pumping out all kinds of toxic nonsense. He claimed AIDS was a curse from God, because homosexuality and abortion were sins. His influence on Ronald Reagan likely contributed to that administration's glacially slow response to the AIDS pandemic. If not for Pat Robertson, folks like Freddie Mercury might still be alive. In 1988, Pat Robertson ran for president because God told him to. It would seem that God has a sense of humor leading Robertson into the political arena where he would get handily trounced. You would think that if God told you to run and then let you get defeated, you'd reasonably come to the undeniable conclusion that God just doesn't like you very much. But no, not Pat. Pat continued his wackadoodle bullshit for decades. He was the mastermind who invested his Jesus dollars heavily in Liberian mineral rights, under then Liberian President Charles Taylor. Blood diamonds. Charles Taylor literally adorned his desk with the heads of his political enemies, heads he had chopped off with his own machete. So, while Pat Robertson bemoaned human rights records in countries the U.S. government wanted to invade, Pat often turned a blind eye to the death and devastation caused by the extraction of diamonds that got him and his Christian network rich. You know, because that's what Jesus would do. Pat also used his 700 Club forum to call for the political assassination of Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez. He claimed Chavez was tyrannical and undemocratic. Funny that Pat took issue with anyone's tyranny, given that Charles Taylor was his bowling partner. And funny, that he took issue with somebody being undemocratic since Chavez was elected and Pat Robertson's buddy George W. was not. 
We didn't hear Pat screaming for recognition of the Al Gore administration. Pat Robertson represented everything terrible and toxic and rotten about America and organized religion. He used wealth and media access in an incredibly cynical and sinister way, a precursor to the alt-right, creating a powerful and dangerous combination of political and religious conservatism that held a really dumb nation hostage for decades. At the end, Robertson continued polluting the airwaves, appearing bent and shriveled with ears the size of satellite dishes. He kind of looked like Yoda. Not the cute baby Yoda, the old one. The one with cabbage patches of hair growing out of his ears. We can all celebrate and sigh relief now because he finally sputtered out after 93 years of breathing air that could have been put to better use. And we can take some sense of joy in recognizing that trans and homophobic Pat Robertson died in the middle of Pride Month. I know. Conventional wisdom says you don't celebrate the death of anyone. But I don't buy that. There's a certain quantum of life this planet holds. So when a particularly nasty specimen takes the dirt map, it's creating space for somebody better. And that's cause for cheering in my book. Don't let the door hit you in the ass, Pat. If there is an afterlife, I imagine Pat will be confronted by the legions of the dead that he doomed with his reckless homophobic rhetoric. And if there is a God, hopefully she's teaching Pat Robertson a valuable lesson. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road, Youngstown, Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.nologs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 610 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm Books is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. Or on the TV, I'll say the forest called me here. is waking outside my window a bell a chow bell a chow bell a chow 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 drive my senses into the sunlight for there are things that i must do oh wish me luck now i gotta leave you a bell a chow bell a chow bell a chow 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 with my friends now in the forest we're gonna shake the gates of hell and we will tell them we will tell them Bella chow, bella chow, bella chow, chow, chow That we Lonnie's not for the franchise And wish the bastards dropped and dead Next time you see me, I might be smiling Bella chow, bella chow, bella chow, chow, chow I'll be in prison or on the TV I'll say the forest called me here Next time you see me, I may be smiling Bella chow, bella chow, bella chow, chow, chow I'll be in prison or on the TV 
I'll say the forest called me here.